Welcome to the Cross Party Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with St. John's Deputy Mayor, Sheila O'Leary. The city of St. John's is Canada's most easterly city and the capital city for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. St. John's is the main commercial, financial, educational, and cultural center for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. It is the location of the seat of the government of Newfoundland and Labrador as well. The city extends from a century-old urban core to include suburban developments, shopping complexes, and industrial sites. It is equipped with all the conveniences of a growing, progressive, metropolitan center. About one-third of Newfoundland's population lives in St. John's and the surrounding area. So we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring St. John's Deputy Mayor, Sheila O'Leary. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Deputy Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for taking time out of your business schedule. Sit down and talk about yourself, talk about your community, and talk about your duty to serve. So that's where I want to start, if you don't mind, Sheila, and to ask you, like I've asked everyone else who's ever come on the show, where does your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Hmm, that's a great question. And listen, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, first and foremost. Um, and where does it come from? Uh, well, certainly I'm born and raised in, in the city of St. John's and but with two, uh, you know, working class parents who who gave immensely to the community. Uh, my mom was a nurse who worked in, uh, in the geriatric field and um, and volunteered and was really, really embedded in community. And uh, my dad was a salesperson, uh, you know, a uh, uh, a well-known baseball uh, figure from Cornerbrook. I had a tryout with the Brooklyn Dodgers. So they had like, a, they were really embedded in community um, uh, their whole lives. And I think it was just the principle uh, of their way of living uh, was that, you know what, we're here, we all give back in some way, whatever well, whatever way it is. So I, I think I really learned from my parents. Um, and uh, and I'll be completely honest that uh, certainly here in our my, my community, uh, Volunteerism is like huge and people stay very, very involved uh, because not, o not only because of desire, but out of need. And so um, I think that that certainly has been the thing that's nurtured me to this point in time. I never thought I was going to get involved in politics, never for a second. So, so this was, was really something organic, right? Was politics discussed growing up? Or was it discussed at the dinner table or it was it was. not? <laughs> It was, it was, but I didn't have any anybody involved in politics in my in my family. But we certainly discussed it, and uh, you know, of course, there was lots of polarization around the whole issue of whether or not you know Newfoundland should have been part of Confederation. All of those conversations certainly happened. My my dad was not uh, a Canadian born; he was a Newfoundlander born. So you know, it, so there's a lot of changes, obviously, that have happened over these past several decades. Um, and I'm very proud to be Canadian, but we have a very strong identity here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and certainly with the city of St. John's as the capital city. Um, you know, we have we have a very strong cultural identity here. So, okay, you talk about politics was discussed. I want to know where the desire to go into municipal politics came from, because you could have chosen many different levels as someone who has a background like you with a mother in nursing potentially could go into provincial but in 2009 you decide municipal is where it is going to be the best service for yourself what was the what was the allure what was the desire to say you know what let's go municipally rather than the other levels of government 
Well, uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a townie entrenched. I'm <laughs> born and raised. Both of my parents, we would term as being Bayman. They were from the west coast of the island. But I was born and raised right in the heart of the city of St. John's. And so uh, deeply rooted in local community. Uh, I come from an activist background. Uh, like I said, you know, it's not, I never imagined that I would get into a political lifestyle. Um, but one of the biggest influences for me certainly was our former mayor and deputy mayor, Shani Duff. Uh, she was a huge mentor to me. She was uh, an incredible, incredible leader who really set the stage for a number of different things, including organizing our own planning department, the, you know, heritage, um, of course, being a woman on council at, at, you know, at this point in time, it was just unheard of. Um, so these were all things that I really dearly respected. And I knew Shani personally. But my personal background was I was an activist. So I started peace festivals with a number of my peers. We were really into youth and social justice um, activities. And so that was that was my that was my background. And at a certain point in time, once I had enough public credibility, you know, from both my career as an art photographer and, you know, my volunteerism in the community, I, it got to the point where I thought, you know what, maybe I should be on the inside instead of outside with the placards. And so it really truly was that that simple concept about wanting to try to make some positive change happen for the community. Okay, so you've used the word activist a few times now, and I, I want to sort of ask a question that I've never asked on the show, so I apologize if it comes out of left field. Okay. I, I've known people who have been large activists growing up. I went to college, went to university. I, I, I was embedded with a few as a former journalist as well. There's always the sense in the activist community that if you become part of the system, you change. So yes. for you, looking back on now five years, or not five years, 15 years in municipal life, is the activist still around or is the deputy mayor now in charge? <laughs> and you know what? It, I think, <laughs> good question. Good question. Uh, I hope that the activist is still alive. Uh, obviously, once you get embedded in systems, you you know, you understand implicitly. Nobody understands until you get elected. Uh, the number of barriers that you have, the number of layers that you have to go through, what it means to uh, develop policy. And of course, you don't do that as a single voice. I mean, you work as a council. So you're never going to do this as, uh, you know, I could stand here and grandstand all day long. And, and I'm really good at that from time to time. But, you know, the reality is you really need to collaborate. You need to work together. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you still don't have a bit of fire in your belly and that you can't bring a number of issues forward. And I, I feel like I have. But there is a delicate balancing act. So it's kind of a bit of a teeter totter. You know, you're up and down. Some days I'm extremely frustrated with the internal process and the slowness of things. And then there's other days where I go, wow, that was wonderful. It was worth it was worth the ride. And the victory, you know, was worth all the effort, um, you know, and you don't win everything, of course. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's a balancing act for sure. But for me, it's about trying to be continue to be authentic and work with integrity. And I think that if I don't change my personality, you know, uh, through that process so that people still know me as Sheila O'Leary, you know, the activist, Sheila O'Leary is deputy mayor, somebody you can pick up the phone and talk to, then then I feel like I've, I've succeeded. Okay, so I'm assuming in, in during the time that you were prior to being on council, you had presented to politicians, you had asked for meetings for politicians. Now on the flip side, you have activists who are who have things that are important to them asking you certain questions, wanting meetings with you. And I'm going to sort of ask a general question, but it's a broad question and sort of give advice, if you don't mind, for a second. What advice would you give to those younger activists who are just on the ground right now saying, you know what, I have an issue that's very important to me, and I don't think our system is doing it correctly. Now being on both sides of the sort of the coin, if you don't mind, what advice would you have given your younger self to better make you a better person to advocate for issues that are important to you now knowing the flip side of being in the municipal government political system that you've been in for the last 15 years? 
I think it's about uh, reaching out, communication and engagement. Absolutely. Be brave enough to reach out to your elected officials and um, not just send an email or, you know, of course, we live in a day and age where social media uh, rules all. And I will be full disclosure. I got off of, uh, you know, X because mental health and all of that, you know, so. Um, you know, I was a, an active participant in many, uh, many forms of social media. Uh, I, I kind of trimmed that the fat off of that because especially with the pandemic and everything else we've seen, obviously people's anxiety levels just skyrocket and uh, my, my own included. So we, we really need to find a way to be kinder with each other and still be critique, be able to critique each other uh, to make, you know, um, you know, really important contributions. And of course, you know, the public, I, I, you know, it's so important that we hear from the public. But for a young activist, <clears throat> I think it's extremely important that you meet face to face with the politicians. Because, you know, sometimes it's all about the boogeyman, you know, it's like us and them and this kind of setup that and, you know, that's the system we've created. But I remember when I was on the other side of the coin, and uh, I was uh, advocating, and I still do, for the cultural community and the arts community here. Um, <clears throat> the mayor at the time was, uh, this was many years ago, was Andy Wells. And I don't know if you you might know his reputation. He was a bit of a bull in a china shop. He has a really uh, you know well-known reputation, or he did, and he's passed on now, rest in peace. But I remember, and people either loved him or hated him because what you saw was it. It was just what you see is what you get. Um, but uh, as a member of the arts community, I remember reaching out and it was a big deal. And if we had a little contingency come and we met with the mayor because we had a number of issues that we wanted to talk to. And it really demystified the whole process. So I'm a, I spent a lot of time doing mentoring, uh, both in women's and gender diverse mentoring. Um, you know, young people, getting them into the council chamber, talking to them, telling them about, you know, the how it's it's exciting to have this kind of exchange and to, you know, bring it on down so that people don't have this us and them kind of concept still working. Now being in office for 15 years, I know <laughs> that environmental 13 advocates, years. 13, 13 years, 13, sorry, sorry, 2009 no, no, to 2000. No yeah, you're right. Um, I know environmental advocacy is quite important to you, and I I I, I, I read an I read an article, an open letter, an open letter, the article that you wrote um, around uh, environmental advocacy and stewardship of the lands. Um, you wrote that in 2015 when it, the environment was kind of a. It was an issue, but it wasn't as pressing of an issue as it is in 2024. Have have you seen changes since you've written that letter in 2015? Massive changes. How Massive. so? Um, well, you're right. It wasn't on anybody's radar. Of course, climate action, everybody's talking the talk now. Whether or not they're actually walking it is yet to be seen. But uh, And you know what? Certainly some communities are doing excellent job at trying to get to uh, net zero in terms of carbon um offset and and you know so there's a number of different things but again not having a political background not being a policy analyst i was an activist i was really really you know i love the reason why i live here is because i love the environment newfoundland in st john's we were right on the crest of the ocean the north atlantic we have all these incredible trail systems we are so blessed to have the kind of resource that we have around us that we can just step out of our door and literally be in the woods or on the ocean. Uh, and that that's the reason why I'm here. There's there's certainly uh, you know downfalls to being in an isolated area as well, but I tell you that is why I made a very concerted decision that I was going to stay and live here because I love the quality of life and because of the environment and nature around. So that was the impetus, actually, that and at social activism around supporting uh, the most vulnerable populations uh, uh, in in our city. And that those are the really the two reasons why I, I jumped in the ring. And um, I was a member of the, the Clean St. John's. It used to be called uh, Clean and Beautiful, St. John's Clean and Beautiful which is all about education, about litter and beautification and keeping our environment pristine. And that's kind of where I started. I was a volunteer on that committee. And 
And um, these are the things that really drove me, right? Because the, the environment is the thing that cradles us all. It's the thing that supports us. And if we do not respect that, inf that infrastructure around us, the na natural world, then what have we got, you know? And so now we know that we are, we're in a crisis mode where people are still yet to jump on board of whether or not they're going to take any climate climate action and the debate back and forth about, you know, axe attacks or this or that or whatever's going on. Meanwhile, you know, the fires are burning, right? And um, and we need to very we need to get serious about it. But when it comes to a municipal level, of course, let's boil it down down. What can you do? So you can have a strong urban forest management plan. You can be, you know, a good steward of uh, wetlands to ensure that development doesn't like isn't the, you know, the thing that outweighs everything else. I mean, you have to have this delicate balance of of development, but you have to protect our water supply. It's so crucial. Um, and of course, you know, and it's not just about drinking water. It's about flood retention. It's about all of those things and about our natural history that we've had about fighting nature as opposed to working with it. And uh, so I'm really, really fascinated. That's the stuff that really drives me, as well as, of course, working for, as I mentioned, you know, more vulnerable, marginalized communities, you know, supporting seniors and and people, you know, who are in the lower socioeconomic uh, uh, end of things. I think that those are the people that need representatives, right? Now, as a municipal councillor in your tenure in office, you have probably come to the realization that... As an elected official, your your sort of um, personal identity, your even uh, ideals are very strong to who you are. But when you walk into that council chamber, you can't hold those ideals very close to your heart on every single issue because you have to look at it as the broader context. Is it hard to balance who you are with who you need to be to represent all of the community because the decisions you make are going to impact them. And even though as someone with your background might believe in something very wholeheartedly, when you look at what it could affect the community, you have to balance that. Or is it for you easy to balance the sort of pros and cons of every issue with your past and who you are today? You know what? No, every day is a, is a battle battleground in my brain. To be completely yeah. honest, you know what? And I think that that probably, I think that's, that's probably a good sign because if I wasn't thinking, I wasn't struggling with, uh, you know, the back and forth, I think that that would be a demonstration that maybe I uh, just, you know, I've, I've kind of lost interest to, you know what I mean? Or the, or the joie de vivre of, uh, of, of the passion for why I'm doing this work. And trust me, there's lots of days I've gone, oh my gosh, I'm just going to run for the hills. This is, this is, you know, not working, but but then, but then you also realize that you are in this privileged position to represent those voices. And I get it all the time as all our municipal representatives do when they're in the supermarkets, when you're out like, you know, in, in the public all the time, it's not the MHAs and it's not the M MPs and they're doing a fantastic work in their own realm, but it's the municipal leaders who are the ones who get approached in the supermarket with all of the issues that are going on. You're always, always on. And that's exciting. It's, you know, sometimes it's draining, but it's also really exciting and a privilege. Now, I'll tell you, my 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 kids long gave up going to the supermarket with me. They That's, that's not happening. But I will tell you, uh, you know what? As much as sometimes the people in your world go, oh my God, here they go again, right? You know, you know, you'll never get out of here. It really is a privilege to be able to be that accessible to the public. So it's, um, it's tough. And you know what? And full disclosure, I did actually run for provincial politics, uh, at uh, and I've had a couple of runs. Um, what during my tenure while I was on uh, municipal uh, council here, but I have to say, it's you know what, it's. It, it, it's apples and oranges. It's a very different way of dealing with things. Obviously, you're much more in a team, you know, when you're obviously in a partisan uh, political position. Municipal politics here is nonpartisan. 
everybody comes with their own philosophy or whatever, but you know what, you're an individual representing the public. And I just try to be as accessible to people as I possibly can try to be responsive. Am I going to, am I going to solve all the world's problems? No. Am I going to solve your problem? Maybe not, but I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to try to see if I can direct you. If I can't do it, if it's not within my ability to help to somebody who may be able to help. And if not, well, at least, you know what, you're going to get my ear. And so then we can try to figure out where from here. Okay, so we're two uh, children of politics. We we seem to both enjoy it. You, you as an elected official, me, I like to speak to municipal leaders. And I've ran myself as well as a municipal candidate, even as a federal candidate. I understand the jurisdictional roles that municipalities play, the provincial plays and the federal government. But you just said something that I say, all, I ask all the time on the show. So I'm going to sort of dive into it a little bit further, if you don't mind. You are the closest to the people. Federation of Canadian Municipalities president, or as of recording this, the president, Scott Pierce, says you are the government of proximity. They know who you are. They probably don't know who their MHA is, or they might know, but they probably don't see them as much as they see you or even their MP because they're in Ottawa. How often are you finding people coming to you with provincial or federal issues that you have to say to yourself, it's not my issue, but I now have to deal with an issue that's not in my jurisdiction because I am the closest to the people. Absolutely. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And so, you know, sometimes you you act as a funnel. You're somebody who goes, OK, well, I can help you and direct you over here to the MHA or the MP's office to try to get the issue addressed. But you know what, you know, and not to be unfair to other levels of government, because look, we, we all have to partner. We it's a partnership, as we know, we get funding from the feds, we get funding through the province, but we have to partner in all of these different projects all the time. But it's easy to get downloaded to the municipal level, let's be honest. It's that's 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 you know, we're the you know, the poor cousin right on the bottom of the tier and in, in some ways, right, in terms of the structure, but at the same time, as I mentioned, it's a privilege because we are the ones who can be there kind of side by side with the representatives, uh, with the residents, um, you know, to bring forward issues. And, you know, I've I've had a long history of working outside of my lane. Uh, you know, I've been told many times, oh, that's not our jurisdiction. That's not our jurisdiction when I bring up, especially environmental issues and uh but I don't care, right? Honestly, because I have a voice, I'm elected. It's the same people we're representing and the effects are gonna affect us all. So why wouldn't I advocate? Why wouldn't I be a lobbyist? So like the issues that I really dug into were, you know, tree regulations right in the city of St. John's. We didn't have any at, the, at one point in time. So really getting the urban forest, um, you know, management plan really like, you know, taken seriously. And, you know, we still have to work on that. Like I said, floodplains and things, cosmetic pesticide issue. Again, uh, you know, I, I lobbied heavy with a, a group, a nonprofit group to get uh, the cosmetic pesticides banned uh, because it was well proven, you know, that, you know, you can use alternatives and it's actually more economically viable for landscape companies to go without. And, you know, that was already happening right across the country. That's provincial jurisdiction. I have a voice. I'm going to go at it. And you know what? We were successful. So there's that. And of course, you may have already talked to uh, or some of my former colleagues about this, but as a former municipalities, Newfoundland, Labrador board member, I advocated and I was a very loud voice and champion with a large group of people to get a single use plastic bag ban. So um, these were all things that were not in my lane. They're not in my lane. You know, this is this is provincial jurisdiction. But who else is going to advocate? Do you do you find people engaged? Do you find that no. people actually really? <laughs> no. Okay, so this no, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to be rude about that. That that really, no, it's just they're not. More and more people today are tuning out of municipal politics because partisan politics, provincially and even federally. Well, let's say federally first and then provincial, have change the way that people view politicians and they just don't come to people be, go, go to politicians because they're they they don't want the partisanship even though municipally you don't have those parties in your community do you get a sense that people understand what's going on in the community or 
not understand what's going on in the community in the sense like events and all that, but like what issues are being debated in front of City Hall right now? Well, you know what? Look, uh, I don't think people are engaged and, and that's not to fault individuals. Everybody's so busy trying to stay alive. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're, you know, people have big challenges right now in terms of food security and the cost of living, uh, you know, after coming out of a pandemic. And I won't use that as the excuse, but it certainly was something that helped, you know, kind of rewrote us all and, and make us think about, you know, what we're doing with our lives. Um but there's so many challenges right now. Like I, I as a as a young person trying to be a homeowner, like for me, I I was an artist and I managed, you know, with challenges and such to get a home and raise my family. And I actually single parented for many of those years. And but I still was able to be sustained. In this day, that right now, a young person coming into the same kind of scenario as me would not have the same opportunities. And uh, that's that's really unfortunate because the, it, our our finances have completely shifted right now. And um, so, you know, I guess it's um, uh, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that. But, you know, really, I think uh, things have changed enormously and the pressures on people. It just do you, why would they tune in? Why would they tune in? They're just so busy trying to stay alive. Right. Do you see that the engagement has changed since when you first were elected in 2009 to when you are mm -hmm. here right now? Because you talked about social media and I, I consider it a double-edged sword because it's a great way that people can reach out with the, so they don't have to leave their house and they don't have to have that human-to-human -human conversation. But it's also a place for anonymity, anonymity and sort of the online quote-unquote trolls. Um do you find more and more people reaching out via social media and doing that electronic engagement rather than that face to face? Because Absolutely. I miss that face to face. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I, you know, I'm really old school. I got to tell you, you know what? I still like hard, uh, like I like my papers, right? You know, I, I just read it differently. Uh, you know, obviously I use all the technology that we need to use just as we're doing right now. But uh, but I like hard copy because I get to feel it and mark it up and just it, there's something really tangible. And, you know, like full disclosure, I'm a photographer. So and I still use film. So I love analog. I like the, I like the old school kind of concept. And that it, that is the same parallel to how I deal with people. I much prefer to pick up the phone. Hello and have a chat. I've got to write out a full email that just explains all of the different, you know, possibilities that we can have <laughs> conversation. I'll, I'll send you a note, but I'm definitely going to have the phone call, the conversation. So you get the full breadth of everything that's possible. And then we can sum summarize it in an email afterwards if we need to have it for the record. But uh, I... I like in person. I like engaging people. I think we've we've lost a lot of that. People message me all the time on Facebook Messenger or otherwise to with their issues about garbage or this or that or whatever the issues are. But what I have to do in order to stay sane is to say, okay, can you take that and bring it over here to my email? And I'll tell you why. It's not I'm not trying to skirt the issue. I'm just trying to put it in the system so that. I can take that then and go to my staff and go to this one and go to that one. It's just the proper route to do it. But people feel much more, um, it, it, they're closer to social media and that's the way that they reach out generally. Uh, so the emails are the, usually the last the last effort, right? To uh, to engage, I find. But, you know, and of course, then there's the, you know, the knee jerk reactions that happen certainly on social media. But when you have a phone conversation with people, that all comes down, it all comes yep. down. Right. It and that's what we does. need to do. We need to be kinder with each other and a little bit more civil. Obviously, we're going to have differences of opinion. We have lots of those. And but you know what? We need to try to make things better. And we're going to have to find some some sort of compromise to do that and be nice to each other. So before we turn to city uh, the city of St. John's as a whole, I've got to ask what sort of off uh, has nothing to do with municipalities, but I've got to know as an amateur photographer, what's the go-to choice for a uh, camera for yourself as someone who uses film still? Is it a Canon? Is it, well, what's, what's your go-to? Oh, I have a, I have a medium format camera. So I use, uh, I have a Mamiya and a Bronica and, uh, but, uh, I've always used Nikon, right. For 35 millimeter, but you know what, honestly, I like secondhand. I buy what I can get my hands on. I'm not about all the gear. I'm about the content. Right. And I think that that's the one thing I, 
I, I like simplicity, right? You know, and so this image here actually behind me is a, is a large uh, analog photograph that I did, and uh, that was shot on a 35 millimeter negative, and but you know, pr hand printed. So there's, um, yeah, there's just some. I love the less is more. I love less is more, right? Uh, Even though I... you know, life is so complicated, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, thank you for answering that. I want to turn to the city of St. John's as a whole. And before I start asking these questions, I want to just preface it as I always do on this show, that this is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion and her opinion alone. She has one vote on council and she needs a majority to pass any. Thing. That right. being said, because I will probably get at least one email that's like slowed down recently because I've been saying that a lot more. But I want to ask you, in your opinion, Deputy Mayor, mm -hmm. what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of St. John's as of recording this in 2024? The biggest one? Well, we all know housing is 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 the massive one and that's that's nationwide we know that that but if i have to be completely truthful i think it's uh, addictions mental health and addictions and i think that that is uh, something uh, that we are really grappling with here uh, in our province and certainly in the city of st john's uh, because we've been a rem fairly remote geographic location for so long oftentimes things come to us last you know we're, you know, sometimes we're a little bit behind in the trends and all of that kind of stuff. Historically, I remember all of that. We were always a couple of years behind whatever was happening on the mainland kind of concept, you know. Um, and it's the same thing for drugs. And the world is a different, different world right now in terms of the opioid crisis and beyond. And uh, and now it's on our doorstep and it has been for several years. And it's the ruination of our youth, to be completely honest. And not just our youth, but, you know, older people as well. But uh, it's it's absolutely devastating. It's absolutely devastating to watch what's happening uh, right now, and uh, and it's one of those things where you need to have massive, massive supports there to help people, uh, help people survive while they're addicted, help people give supports, and then also try to figure a way forward so that they can try to get off of it. Uh, but most times, it's just about survival, and I think that that is the number one issue that we are dealing with, not just in this city, but certainly, you know, across the country, uh, but it's here now as well. And uh, it's just, it, it's, it, it's breaking apart our society in so many ways. And where does that come from? Well, we have, you know, obviously we've, we've seen the drug trade explode and, you know, of course the resource is not there for our policing or whatever and stuff like that, but let's talk about poverty, right? I'm big, I'm a big advocate of a basic income. Um, um, you know, I know it, was, it used to be a really scary concept, you know, for a long time, but now we're talking more and more about it. But the reality is our world has changed. And um, and there's so many people that are living below the poverty line now, and they need a leg up until we figure out a better system, until we figure out how things are going to, you know, how we're going to serve everybody in the community. Because, you know, the rich are still getting richer. And you know what? And I'm all about, you know, um, the opportunity for people to have great opportunities and to thrive but it's really i think our responsibility as elected people to make sure that everybody gets represented so you've just mentioned something that is not in the municipal purview though that's right mental health and addictions is a provincial and even federal issue yeah. but you are not the first and you will probably hmm. not be the last person who mentions this on that sh uh, men mentions it on my show. Hmm. What does the city of St. John's do now to address the issue while understanding that the resources you put towards an issue that is not in your purview, that is not in your jurisdiction has to come from somewhere without raising, potentially raising taxes because people are struggling right now but you want to help solve this issue while the province yeah. and the federal government take their time because it off, it's often said the municipality you pass a bylaw it literally gets enacted a day two days after you pass a bylaw provincial government could be three months to six months even a year federal government we could be about 10 years until we actually see things happen joking yeah. all in course 
Yeah. What does the municipality do now? And what is the municipality doing right now to address the issue? Understanding that you have to help your people locally because you are the closest to the people. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of different ways. Well, right now, I mean, it's all about, as I mentioned before, partnerships, because yeah. I mean, you know, just the municipalities by themselves cannot do anything. We 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 feel the 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 issue, uh, but we don't have the resource. And so we have to work in conjunction with with the, the province and the federal government, certainly financially to try to address a number of these issues. Uh, but again, we don't have a health mandate, but we do. Um, we did receive some federal funding recently. Um, uh, for building uh, healthy communities to save for healthy communities. And so part of that initiative there is to try to find ways that we can work in conjunction with uh, co community players that know what they're doing. Uh, honestly, my my feeling is that, you know, government is there to support the people who know what they're doing. And we have a number of incredible on the ground uh, organizations that support whether or not it's the St. John's Women's Center or Stella Circle or the Gathering Place or uh, Bridges to Hope or uh, any of these nonprofit organizations that really, they're the, they're the frontline workers. They're the ones who are working directly with people who are the most dis disenfranchised. Those are the people that we need to support. So I think that, um, and also the adage of nothing, nothing uh, about us without us kind of thing, right? You really need to have people who understand what the flora is of the mental health and, and addictions issue, uh, you know, in uh, in the city. So it's about engagement, making sure partnerships, not just partnering at the gov government level, but but more importantly, in support of the organizations that really know what's going on out there. So I want to I want to sort of play a little bit of devil's advocate with you for a second because I agree with you a hundred percent that partnerships is probably a key uh, key way forward to address this issue municipally, but we often forget buy in buy in from residents who say yes we need to solve this issue yes we need to put money towards it because they're your boss and I hate to say it that way but technically yep. they elect you so they they are the ones who put you there so unless you have buy in from the community you are literally potentially throwing money at an issue that the people do not want solved or don't care about so do you get do you get a sense because we talked about engagement but do you get a sense that people want this issue solved they, and they don't care if it is a federal, provincial or municipal solution? They just want it solved to help people. Absolutely. But that's where we have to continue to be educators as well. We have to bring awareness as well. Uh, I mean, it's unfortunate that we have to have so many different hats uh, with the, 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 you know, the small amount of resource that we have, but it's really important. Like we, we have really, I've seen over the past 13 years, our engagement, um, uh, uh, with the city of St. John's just like skyrocket. I mean, we've gotten really fine tuned in ter terms of how we engage people, but we still don't see, you know, massive numbers showing up. We, you know, have all of the ways that, you know, all the information ready for people, I think, um, you know, we have to also find other ways to search. And sometimes it's about the supermarkets. But I will tell you, quite frankly, that, you know what, if we were to just work from fear-based, because that's oftentimes what happens, people are afraid of change. And we need change. We need it big time. And that's not just in the housing situation. Like right now, where we are taking on a, a debate about uh, text amendments uh, to rezone so that we can allow more density. We've we've had this incredible um, opportunity to have all kinds of single houses and R1, R2 and all these different uh, zones for a long time. But people are going to have to start getting used to the fact that we have to live more densely, densely in a city, um, you know, because of the cost of running a city. Um, you know, it just makes more sense environmentally. Uh, you know, for all of the different reasons, but more importantly, we have to provide affordable housing for people. I'm not talking about social housing. I'm not talking about uh, just affordable for anybody to be able to live in. So we're right in the thick of that right now. And if we had to just say, OK, you know what? Not in my backyard is alive and well <laughs> everywhere, I'm sure uh, you kind of have to kind of bite your, you know, we're engaging for sure. But I know 
that we have to get serious about this issue. We need housing desperately. We've got people in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador that are unhoused. And you know what? We never knew that as a history and now it's here. So we have to we have to deal with it. So, uh, you know what? I'm a bit of a tough love kind of gal. I, uh, I really believe in engaging and hearing what people have to say. And I want to hear from experts. I'm always got an open mind. But I also believe in a bit of tough love that, you know what? Change is coming. And we have to do these things in order to make a better uh, city. And that's part of our responsibility as leaders. It's not all about engaging because if we left it completely to the public, then then you're missing an opportunity to actually lead. So it's this balancing act between taking leadership and you know hearing from the public. You're gonna hear from the public next election, doesn't matter. If people don't like you and they don't like your ideas, you're gone. So do what you can within the, the period of time that you have. I have one more year left, that's what I know. What am I gonna do with that? That's okay. what I know, that's all I know. So you mentioned two challenges, housing and mental health and addictions. Housing we didn't talk about, but mental health and addictions we did. <laughs> I I would hazard a, hazard a guess right here, right now, that if I went downtown St. John's and I stopped 100 people on the sidewalk and I asked them what their biggest issue that is facing the city today, they're going to give me 100 different answers. Yep. You as a municipal official have to look at the city as a whole without forgetting the individual. And yes. the individual believes that they're the most important individual in that community. How do you balance exactly? How do you balance the individual needs of your community with the greater community as a whole? Because when people pay their property taxes, which we're recording this in June, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. like every other province, yeah. you're about to send out your tax bills if you haven't already. They're yeah. going to say, What am I getting for my money that I'm spending to the city? How do you balance the community with the individual? Um, I think it's, a, you know, again, going back to being authentic and real in your conversations. Um, people need to understand that uh, there's no quick fix to anything. <clears throat> and taxes are never going to go away. That's the reality of how we actually function as a society. I know. It's an awful. Breaking, break, breaking news. Taxes will not go away. Whoa. <laughs> And the reality of tax is actually going down, right? You know, yeah. again, no, it's, um, you know, it's it's just part of the pain of running a society is that, you know, I mean, how long have we been doing the taxation system? And you know what? And here we're really the property tax system. Of course, that's a whole other co concept is like such a regressive taxation system. So, I mean, you know, we're we're, you know. That's that's I you know I have all kinds of issues with that and we've discussed it umpteen times but again we don't control that right that's a legislation that comes from a higher level so we're in the in the process right now of waiting for a city of St John's Act which we've been uh, really lobbying for for quite some time I mean we still have like horse and carriage references and all that kind of stuff in in our city act so we're long overdue uh, for a refresh in terms of um uh having the control and the legislative authority to do things that we really need to do in a grown-up city now and um and so we're waiting patiently and continuing to lobby the province so that we can get our new city act and hopefully that'll give us some opportunity to address a number of modern challenges that we have you know so but um yeah so it's i want to I want to flip the question because I'm cautious of time here for a second because I didn't okay. realize we're almost 45 minutes in and okay. I have not asked this question. I think it's an important one to play, to flip the very first question in a segment about challenges, because I don't want to assume that every community just has its challenges. You do have your accomplishments as well. You have things that you are proud about. You are, you have things that you are like as from a municipal governance administration standpoint, we're going to talk about some tourist spots in two seconds, but for you, what is the thing from a governmental perspective that you are the most proud of when it comes to the city of St. John's? Uh, I Well, there's a number of things, but certainly uh, gender equity. Uh, that's been something that's been certainly on my mind as somebody who was elected and the only woman on council. Um uh, and you know what? That makes a difference. Uh, I've been the co-chair for Equal Voice NL uh, with uh, my co-chair Lynn Hammond for many years, and of course former mayor deputy uh, deputy mayor and former mayor Shani Duff. 
uh, was one of the first proponents of Equal Voice, the local chapter here. <clears throat> I mean, it was unheard of that, you know, women were going to be elected or it was the it was just an anomaly when it happened. Uh, now, you know, the whole idea certainly of gender equity in, in, on a broader scale, you know, um, trans representation, um, you know, the queer community. Um, and obviously, BIPOC, you know, we're talking about, you know, getting a real diverse kind of, and we're still not there yet, but you know what, we're moving in the right direction. And, uh, and we're, we have like strong committees that are making solid recommendations to council. Um, you know, <clears throat> our, our community's changing big time. Uh, you know, we, we are open to the world now and, and our community is becoming much more multicultural than it ever has been before. And at the same time, interestingly enough, we're starting to address reconciliation efforts for all of the indigenous people that have been here all along <clears throat> or have been eradicated um, in our history and starting to address that in the mix. And uh, that's one of the contentious issues or, or not for some people that's coming up on our agenda in a day or two about um, you know whether or not we change discovery day to National Indigenous Persons Day, you know, this, these kind of things. And so we're, we're very, um, I'm very uh, happy about the incredible collaborative work that has happened with First Light, which is our St. John's Native Friendship Center. <clears throat> There's a, a group that has been formed called First Voice, which is a, a collaboration from the city of St. John's and First Light. Um, which is all about uh, uh, decolonizing and reconciliation and how do we do that as a city? And how do we do that without getting, of course, you know, traditionalists like completely out of their skin? Um, so, yeah, so it's, you know, these are changes that need to happen, but I'm really proud about the work that has happened in that realm. I'm really proud about the focus that has ha been happening in terms of sustainability and then the environment. There's been a lot of things in that realm, we've got some great staffers who've been really crackers who have helped us elevate that issue for us. Everybody needs to do the work, right? And uh, so we're, we're seeing some su great success in that area as well. I want to turn to my last seg segment now, and it's my favorite subject because later this year, because yes, I have actually scheduled it in September, uh, August and September. I will be coming to the Maritime Provinces, well, the Atlantic Canada, Atlantic Canada, to visit all four provinces in Atlantic Canada, including Newfoundland and Labrador. And okay. that means I will be making a stop in St. John's. So I've okay. got us. Oh, exactly. So as I've said, if you come on the show, I come to your community and it is officially said August and September, I'm coming to Atlantic Canada. The show is going on the road and we're going to be interviewing some municipal leaders across uh, Atlantic Canada during that time. So I've got to ask, as a potential tourist, not a potential now, but a tourist coming to your community, what should I see and what are the hidden gems that you recommend to people? I don't want oh the gosh. traditional stuff. I want the hidden gems, the thing that you say, you know what, this needs to be put on the radar a little bit more. <laughs> oh, well, you know, well, you have to you have to just come and have a sense of the the place. If you've never been here before, you just have to go to Signal Hill, uh, which is Parks Canada, Cabot Tower. Uh, that gives you a sense of place. It helps you understand why Europeans actually settled here in the first place, because our harbor is this beautiful little, it has a little opening, a little narrows, and a beautiful harbor, really protected. You wouldn't even know it's there if you went by in a ship. And that's the reason why this place was settled. So you have to understand that history, because we are entrenched in history. And I'm talking well beyond, obviously, in terms of our Indigenous history as well. But, you know, in terms of European history, the reason why it was settled in the way it was, you have to understand context. And uh, it's it's quite magnificent, the Narrows. So that would be the number one thing that you have to do. So uh, you have to go to Signal Hill and then you'll understand the layout of the place. Uh, you also have to go to Cape Spare because that's the most Northeastern um, point in North America. So when you, when you go out to Cape Spare, which is about a 20 minute drive outside of the city, <clears throat> it's, uh, you're on the edge of the earth. You're on the edge of the earth and that's it, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible feeling and it gives you a good sense of perspective. It also gives you a, a good sense of the hardship that people endured in order to actually exist here and continue to exist here. Like the weather right now, do you know what the temperature is right now? I will tell you on May 27th or 28th, whatever, 27th. 
it is like five degrees. We have rain in this in the springtime. It's hit or miss because we have this fog bank off the, the the Grand Banks that just wants to engulf us, right? But it's also the thing that nurtures us. It's also the thing that feeds the the fish and the and it's the icebergs coming down and it's the whales coming north and you know so there's a whole ecosystem behind it. No, we don't have the the twenty five degree temperatures that many other people are thirty. You know, in other parts of the country where we have a different climate, but we will get summer and it's going to be gorgeous. And I'll tell you, you're coming in August September. That is the sweet spot. August and September are just my absolute favorite times to be here. I refuse to travel anywhere. It's the time to be here. So you're coming at the right time. But well, hopefully we so can grab a things. coffee while I'm there. Oh, I hope so too. And <laughs> uh, the other thing I will tell you for people who are able-bodied uh, to hike or things like that, or mountain bike, uh, the East Coast Trail Association is celebrating their 30th anniversary. I cannot say enough about that organization. They basically worked tirelessly with a volunteer board to etch out all of these incredible ocean trails. So you can walk for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers along the uh, the, uh, the the coastline, uh, and uh, just see the most incredible, incredible seascapes. Uh, it's truly magic, and so I have to give a shout out about that. So if you if you do like to hike a little bit, and you don't have to be like the real hardcore one, there are many different levels of trails that you can do. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's nature's number one. And then, of course, you're going to discover that the people are just awesome. So where do you go? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day being deputy mayor and just being yourself, is yep. there a spot in the community you can go and just let it all go, recenter yourself, refocus, and know that tomorrow morning you're yep. going to have to do the exact same thing to make your community a little bit better than you left it the day before? Okay, I'll give you a couple of couple of places. Well, number one, Signal Hill. There's a Cabot Trail. There's a trail. It takes uh, probably an hour tops, probably a little bit less than that if you're going a good clip. Uh, you know what? Every day I do it, you're right on the edge, and it's uh, it's it's different every day, and it's it just totally gets you outside of your head. So uh, there's the Cabot Trail on Signal Hill Trail uh, that I do. Um, there's Long Pond, Pippi Park. We have this incredible park in the middle of the uh, the city called Pippi Park. And there's a beautiful pond called Long Pond. And there's a fluvarium, which is this really cool little educational spot where you can go in and see all the fish underneath the river. And um, uh, But there's a beautiful trail around um, and all kinds of trails with, within that park as well. Uh, that's truly beautiful. And the other thing, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the arts and cultural and the foodie culture downtown in particular but certainly citywide and like i said we, we we've got a really growing uh, international community here as well too so it's not just you know fish and chips anymore <clears throat> we've uh, we, you know we've grown up in terms of uh, you know certainly cuisine and uh, there's a lot of really great restaurants around that people are really you know paying attention to uh, foraging and local food that people might have turned a, an eye to, you know, turned away from, you know, previously. Um, and, uh, you know, just incredible chefs out there. And the arts and culture community is on fire. So the other place you have to go to is the rooms, the rooms, provincial gallery, archive and museum. There's just something for everybody there. It's just beautiful. Just an incredible, incredible uh, building that houses so much history and so much culture. So my final question for you, uh, and it's an important one. It's the million dollar question at the end of the day, but I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it, but it's it's always great to hear it right from their mouth. In your opinion, what makes the city of St. John's such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think it's the people and the fact that we're so close. Well, you asked me one. But I said, OK, it's it's the people. The people are super, super friendly. You know, they uh, I think we're, we're used to kind of working within kind of a smaller town where we really need to rely on each other in order to survive kind of mentality. And even though we live in a modern world, I think that that still is pervasive and but also our proximity to nature. So those two things. And it, you know what, look, and that is the same answer, honestly, because why are we separating ourselves from nature in the first place, right? It's a holistic kind of thing. I think if the more connected we we stay with nature and the natural world around us, 
the better off we're going to be as a human race. So that's, so I have to say two for one. <laughs> hey, um, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today. This is this is a great way to start my. Uh, we're recording this on a Monday, but this is airing uh, not on a Monday potentially. So um, this has been a great way to start a day. It's always a pleasure to get to know people who have such a passion for municipal life and municipal politics, like you do. And I'm so honored that you took time out of your busy schedule to do this. Wow. Um, I I know you're going to be at the upcoming Federation of Canadian Municipalities convention, so hopefully we. Can grab a grab a high or grab a small little chat off the re uh, off to the side of the convention while it's taking place because I I have newfound respect for a city of St. John's for electing such a great person. Oh, like I can't wait for you to come, <laughs> and I will definitely have a coffee with you. I I look forward to it because I haven't been to Calgary for a very very long time. It's been since 1992, and I know that there's been sweeping changes since that point in time. So, uh, no, anything I can do, I, I think you'll find that, you know, Newfoundlanders in general are, are ambassadors. We all love to show off our, our place, you know, with all its bumps and, and things. It's uh, it's truly a special place. And uh, you know what? I can't wait for you to come. So uh, and, and it's been a privilege. Thank you so much for inviting me to share. I, I, you know, I really just think that municipal work is such important work. Uh, you know, it's really challenging, super challenging work. But it's where you can really, truly do some some honest, authentic work, right? And uh, kudos to everybody who signs up to do that, right? Because there's a lot of little communities out there and people doing it under much more duress than I have on my plate in a bigger city. So, uh, yeah, here's to all the municipal leaders. Sheila, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse interviews that we have coming to you from coast to coast to coast. We're at the Canadian Federation of Municipalities Conference here in Calgary, Alberta over the next few days, and we're going to be bringing you great conversations from that convention over the next few weeks. So if you want to stay informed, hit that subscribe button. But also... If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website or in the show notes below. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. <laughs>